did. I need to find that. I uh, I, I read it. But I, I can tell you what they are real quick. Okay, uh, let me write down. <clears throat> All right, what are they? Warbling Vireo. Yeah, that's what we got there. All right. Male Baltimore Oriole. Okay. Male Orchard Oriole. Okay. Just caught a mistake. A Great Crested Flycatcher. Okay. Yellow-billed cuckoo. Okay. And then we, we close out with a pretty flower picture. Oh, okay. That's cool. All right. That buff-breasted flycatcher that you had up there is only found in the state of Arizona. Which one? And it's a, the buff-breasted flycatcher. Uh, and this that's is a, a very, very difficult bird to find. Yeah, this is a great crested, not a buff. Yeah. Buff, yeah. But I mean, earlier you did play the, you did show the picture of the buff-breasted. That's the one that's make very sure. rare. Next time I'm going to embed these videos. Are we supposed to be hearing the program right now? What's that? Am I Not supposed here. to be hearing on the wing? Oh, no, we're just doing a countdown. So Okay. Okay. No audio right now. Uh, where are the audio? Your mics are hot. They're hearing everything you say. How's the family, Scott? <laughs> What's that? How's the family? They are fine. They're good. Yeah. yeah. How about your family? Everything's ducky. Ducky. <laughs> <laughs> Get it? <laughs> man, you winged that one, didn't you? Yeah. Oh. oh. <clears throat> now, Scott, don't start pecking at us. Yeah. That's right. This show is for the birds, right? Yeah, we're, but we're not trying to feather our nest with it. <laughs> Pekka says, ladies and gentlemen, what a terrific Thursday. It's going to be better and better every day. It's true. That's the attitude right there. <clears throat> yes, Mike Wiesner. Are you guys just winging it? <laughs> yes, Mike Wiesner. We're winging it. Yeah. Somebody said the show would never fly. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're really only a fledgling, fledgling show. <laughs> That's right. We are. We're not even out of the nest yet. <laughs> oh, brother! You know, some people would say we're cuckoos for. Uh, no, we're just a bunch of show. eggheads. Twenty-four seconds. Hike. There you go. Look at all the starlings. I want to. I want to go out and see that. I have seen it before. It's you know, it's called murmuring. Murmuring. M u r m u r r i n g. That's actually the word for it. Hmm.
Well, hello everybody. This is Scott Roberts with Dan George and Kent Martz on our, this is our second on the wing program. Is that right? That's right. That's right. So it's very cool. Um, I, uh, uh, we, we will also have right after this program, uh, we have uh, Dr. Caitlin Ahrens will come on. Uh, she, you know, she's from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and she's also the host of Seven Months of Science that we uh, produce. Um, but she's going to be talking about the upcoming Venus missions. And then uh, Jerry Hubble will be on as well. So uh, got uh, a double header today. Birds in the universe. <laughs> so uh, Kent and, and Dan, I, I'll, I'll let you guys take it away. But, um, um, you know, one of the things I looked at recently was the uh, Cornell Ornithology Lab. They have kind of like a university, um, which I'm going to start promoting on our show. Uh, but uh, I thought there were a lot of really interesting resources there. So you can learn a lot about birds for free by taking their classes. Um, I'll try to get the uh, link and put it in the, in the chat here today. Uh, but I'll let you guys take it away from here. All right. So let me share my screen. And we're working with some crazy new technology. So uh, hopefully this is going to work. All right, so Dan, can you see that? I can. All right, so we're starting out with a, a photo we showed last week that we hypothesized from the nest and not really be able to see the bird very well that it was gonna be some kind of Oreo. Well, we were sort of right, it was a Rio, but it turns out it was a warbling Vireo uh, that Terry identified it as because he was watching and, and messaged me. So I want to start out and correct that error so this is a warbling video that he took here in uh, Northwest Arkansas. I'm gonna play the sound. I'm actually gonna play a video off in the corner. And uh, in a lot of these bird videos, there's a whole lot of bird sounds that are in the videos and they're from other birds in the area. So you gotta sort of watch the bird to see when its mouth moves and know that is the sound. So here we go, the warbling video. I'm going to go ahead and stop it. Dan, Dan, what do you know about this? Based on the premise that all 900 plus species of birds in North America, each bird has its own distinctive call, believe it or not. They're similar, but anytime you're in the wooded forest like this, anywhere in the United States, by the way, they're in all 50, oh no, all 48 contiguous states. Um, this particular bird, if you hear that sound, you will know it's a, a warbling vireo. I mean, it's a five and a five and a half inch long, wonderful little flycatcher as a general category of, of uh, insectivores, which basically just eat flying insects and, and uh, worms and things like that. But this is a marvelous little bird and it's such a happy, it, it just sings and never stops. And what range does it have? Do you know the range? Anywhere, the, anywhere all the way up to, all the way up of all 48 contiguous states, plus the three Western um, uh, Canadian provinces. Provinces of Canada, okay. Yep. Um, and you'll only see them nesting in the springtime. Are all vireos, I assume, and this is an assumption on my part, um, I'm good at asking questions. Do all vireos make a basket nest like this, or are there other vireo methods of nesting, do you know? No, I, I really can't say. I mean, there are numerous vireos in North America. Mm -hmm. And one, one of the unique things about a vireo is they have a tendency to repeat the same call over and over. Uh, if, 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 if you'll hear a distinctive sound and you're gonna hear it repeat that repeatedly. 
is what that is. And so that but tells I don't know you, about the, I don't know about the nesting. I could look it up, but at this point, uh, it's interesting okay. that this particular bird it nests similar to an oriole. And so um, that saw that bird as as we heard it, it just keeps repeating that same call over and over again in a fairly rapid succession. That becomes a that's clue that it's a, a some flavor of vireo. That's that's exactly right. Okay. Well, all, most birds will have a song and then they will have a, um, a chirp or some other kind of a noise that indicates to other vireos, let's say in the forest, that I'm here, okay? So they, that's their song, but they also have little calls and chirps. So I'm gonna play just another snippet of this video real quick. Yeah, I like it. I like the, uh... It's almost like a little slur when 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 he, when he sings. Yeah. And by the way, and typically most ma most males are the ones that will sing, but there are some females that will also sing. All right, so we're going to move on, and we're going to go to the uh, uh, and the picture we just saw was a uh, um, photo by uh, Terry Stanfield. Now, here's a photo by Sheldon Farski. This is a male Baltimore Oriole, and here we go. There, there's about seven species of, of Orioles in North America, and this is the one that would win the, the, uh, the pageant for being the most handsome. And probably the most easily recognizable. Yes, because of the orange, the orange breast and the black head, you'll see uh, white outer, yellow white, yellow outer tail feathers, and you'll see that very prominent rump that's also yellowish orange. And here we go. Here's the sound. It's almost a whistle sound. Yeah. Can you play another one there, Terry? I, not Terry. I meant that can't. Yeah. yeah. It's going to loop. Here comes another one. They're kind of quiet. Well, when, when you hear that noise in the forest, you will know immediately that it is an Oriole. And the trick is to just listen to the sounds over and over again and try and memorize that. Is there another sound on there? Um, nope, that's all it is. That's it. How about this in your video? app, Dan? I'm going to check that out because I mean, I'm always excited when I go birding, which is frequent. When I go out there and I hear this particular sound, uh, I'm excited because I know it's about, I know that it's an Oriole. Of course, since I'm in Colorado, I don't, we don't have the Baltimore Oriole here. We have the Bullocks Oriole, but they're, they're similar, but the sounds they make are similar as well. Let's see. Um, uh, let's see. Baltimore Oriole. Oriole. Time for commercial. Yeah, I've Let's downloaded see. the app. Commercial. <laughs> I've downloaded the I, app. We just, um, we just dropped a thousand people, you know. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I've downloaded the app. It's uh, uh, I haven't played with it much. Uh, well, let's see. But you can take pictures of pictures because I was I wanted to verify that was a warbling vireo, so I took a picture of it on my screen and it popped up as a warbling vireo, so it knew what was uh uh going on what it was okay i got a sound here it, i'm gonna turn it up loud okay yeah we can hear that hear that chatter yeah okay we'll stop there that chatter right there is known by orioles 
And so anytime, if you're in the East, you got the Baltimore, or mm -hmm. if you come out to the West and you get the Bullocks, they will make, I got to, how do I shut this thing up? I just did yeah. <laughs> that, that sound. See, I, I happen to, uh, I've been birding by ear for probably 20 years now. It's challenging wow. to do that. Yeah. But once you've been out enough and you've seen enough and you've identified the bird to the call that you're hearing and now all the other things that, that can help you identify it, mm -hmm. that particular song right there is only exclusively belongs to the Oriole. It's wonderful. It's fantastic. Yeah. Very all right. Cool. So moving on, because we're trying to be done by 430, 435. Um, the next slide is where I get it to go. The a photo by Sheldon. It's the orchard oriole. So we'll see if we hear that sound that you were talking about. Now, Sheldon uses an Explore Scientific ED80 to take all of these images that you're seeing. Uh, it's a 102, isn't it? It's either an 80 or a 102. No, it's an 80. It's, it's an, an 80. 80. Yeah, FCD yeah. 100 glass. So here we go. Now, as you heard that last little note, mm -hmm. you'll notice how similar that is to the Baltimore. It's a very similar um, single note, basically. So when you hear that, you know it's an Oriole. Now, when it comes down to the Orchard Oriole versus the Baltimore, there's some similarities, but they are different. And this picture that uh, Kent has up here is the, is the male, and uh, it's got that uh, pretty... Uh, well, whatever color that actually is, it's a, it's a beautiful color. It's not orange at all, not yellow at all. It's just that. Uh, it's almost an auburn. Orange. It's almost like an auburn color. Yeah. And the orchard oriole is only found from about Kansas all the way to the East Coast. It's not a Western bird. Mm. So, um, a beautiful bird. You know, with that auburn color, you know, think about maybe auburn or a, it's not rust, it's darker than kind rust. Of a wine colored or something. Yeah. Yeah. But just a beautiful bird. Mm -hmm. um, so, slide number four. Hang on, where are we at? Slide number four is a photo by Terry Stanfield of a great crested flycatcher. And uh, Dan, what can you do? You know this song? Go ahead and play it there. I'm looking it into my book here, so I'll have it real okay. momentarily. These introductory notes, usually one or two notes, uh, when you hear that and you've heard it enough and you're in, it's in the range of a great crested flycatcher, which by the way is only an eastern bird from let's say the, the uh, central fly zone all the way to the east coast, you will know that that's a great crested flycatcher. It's not a faint sound, it's actually an aggressive sound and you know that that bird is a great crested flycatcher. So and whenever you hear, whenever you have the word flycatcher or vireo um, in a, in a species of birds, they're always always uh, catching flying insects and worms. They don't. So don't put out seeds looking for a flycatcher because they're not going to come to your feeder. So put out bugs. Put out bugs. Exactly. Will they come to a tray of dead bugs, or do they have to be flying pretty well to? to catch them i i i would say no because they're, they're kind of solitary whenever there's a whenever there's a great flesed, great crested flycatcher in your area there's probably not a lot of them unlike a sparrow or starling or something like that so just a beautiful blur i mean just beautiful very subdued grays though 
you know, but you can look at its head and see the crest that uh, it's named for. Um, and noticing that the tail has some reddish color to it as well. Um, a lot of times I can remember my dad, you know, w w counting the number of bars on the wings and using that to help him identify, you know, circles, circles around the eyes. Does it have a, what color is that circle? You know, shape of the beak, you know, little subtle details, um, you know, especially in the sparrows, you know, become very important details to remember. Um, and dad would be describing it and mom would write it down. And then they'd start looking at the bird book and trying to identify it. So now here's a bird that, you know, in, in our neck of the woods, you hear all the time, you don't see it very much, but it is the um, yellow, bello, be yellow billed Hello. cuckoo, <laughs> it's also known as the rain crow. So there are conditions that make it start making a specific call that predict, you know, before we all had apps on our phones, you, you know, you used the things in nature and by, by being aware of your surroundings, you know, coupled with the kind of clouds there were, they'd noticed that uh, uh, the cuckoo started making a specific call before a rain happened. And so they became known as the rain crow. And here we go. sound right there is the cuckoo sound what? I know. That call, oh, wow. yeah, that's, the, that's the distinctive call. Right. Now that's the, like a woodpecker or something hitting a tree. You know, when you consider that in there the burning is. world, there's about 35 different warblers and there's about 20 different types of flycatchers. But when it comes to the cuckoo, there's only two. So you don't really need to wonder which one it is. It either has a yellow bill or it has a black bill. There's a black-billed cuckoo that um, they both live in the same area. Also, basically from about Colorado all the way to the East Coast and are more, more prominent in the South. Mm -hmm. They're but also that, 12 inches long. So when you see one, you see a pretty big bird. Mm -hmm. You know, but that, that knocking sound almost like a woodpecker, but it's clearly not a woodpecker, is the sound that I hear. But I, I like to immediately go, oh, that's a cuckoo. So range is what, Dan? The range, basically from, uh, let's say, from New Mexico all the way to Florida, and then it goes up as high as uh, New York and uh, New Jersey that way. Um, they're, not, they're, un they're not uncommon at all. Um, and, and they are not in big flocks. You, you, when you see one, you'll probably see one and it's mate somewhere, right. but you will not see several of them. And so last, uh, you know, and so, so I guess these ranges you see in bird books, you see the range maps that is simply built over decades and decades of observation and, and people turning in their observations and that being mapped to create the, these range maps is that's the only way it could happen, right? Yes, there's an organization called the um, American Ornithological Union. Ornithology, or, ornithology basically is a word for birding, a study of birds. So the AOU has input from Cornell and input from various resources to determine if, if, if a particular bird shows up in San Diego, but, it's only, but only has ever been seen in North Carolina, how often has that bird shown up in California? Because if it's only been once in 20 years, it will not show the range of including San Diego. You follow me? Right. It has to be yeah. multiple, multiple sightings over years. But since birds do not, birds do not have um, boundaries, they're, they're motivated by food, shelter, and water. Habitat. And also, and also heat. 
you know, warmth or whatever. So certain, certain, like a snowy owl will only be seen in Minnesota. You'll never see it in Florida, but God created them or whoever, however you believe it. Snowy owls are called snowy owls because they blend into snow when you don't have that in the South. So, right. <clears throat> so nothing like being obvious, right, Scott? So sometimes, That's right. Sometimes <laughs> the names are not obvious, but, you know, I mean, like the, the how did they decide, decide a vireo was a vireo and, you know, an oriole was an oreo? I mean, you know, I'm sure there's entomology of those names. I haven't looked it up and I should, but, you know, these these names go back for a long time. Hmm. Uh, yeah, you know, there's no way we can give an answer to that that would be acceptable to anybody. Right. So there's, anyway, there's a question here from Mike Wiesner. He wants to know, um, are there bird range mappings that have changed over time? Same for, say for climate change or light pollution. Yes, there, the, the, I would say considered by most uh, birders, the Bible that they use is the National Geographic Field Guide of North American Birds. Mm -hmm. And they're right, they are now in their, I think, eighth edition over the last 30 years. And you could study those, those you can study those uh, range, every bird has got a range view uh, um, um, picture on that page and it shows you what you can typically see in these areas or what the range would be. And I will bet you there's been lots of changes over the years because they will change because of circumstances. I see. So, so Dan, when, do you report all of your sightings, record them and report them to? Uh... I, I'm basically just what's called a field, or, <laughs> a field ornithologist, which means I'm just a hobbyist. Um, there, there are a lot of people that are very active with the Audubon Society, or more specifically would be the, um, um, the uh, what's, it's, um, um, I'll get it, I'll get it in a second. There's, there's more than just the National Audubon Society that's involved in bird watching, and they all are, are basically field um, ornithologists that are interested in the behavior of birds and what their ranges are. And that kind of thing. The um, um, wild bird, uh, I, I'm, I'm losing my thought there, but there's one large organization. I can't even think about it, right? Because I've not been active with them for quite a long time. I'm just dangerously full of information. <laughs> <laughs> dangerously? <laughs> Some of cool. us all, we all suffer from that. The key is to knowing you suffer from it. <laughs> yeah. So I have cat tail in my face. That's what I got. I'll tell you. Uh, so, so there are people out there that report all of their sightings that help create new data on these species. So that it's not a static map that we assume is always there. Enough people get report reporting and, you know, things like the great American backyard bird count that happens on, is it Christmas day or new year's day or whatever, you know, that I know there's things out there people participate in, and count and report, you know, uh, just like in astronomy, there's there's ways to report, you know, your uh, sky brightness and uh, or yeah. sky darkness. Uh, the same with birds. There's ways to report these and you can help and be a citizen scientist and turn in your information and help build the knowledge base of the current state of these birds. So the National, um, National Audubon Society has a what's called an annual bird Christmas bird count. Right. And there literally, literally are thousands of casual bird watchers in their areas. Okay, now they're not traveling outside the state, for example. So yes, that's the that's the largest uh, resource of uh, raw data that goes to the National Audubon Society. And I'm I'm, I'm just guessing that they cooperate with uh, Cornell Ornithological Laboratories in New York. And um, anytime you see something from National Audubon or from uh, or from Cornell, especially, mm -hmm. uh, that's called validation. That's cool. You, yeah. So moving on to end with our pretty picture. If I can make my computer go. There we go. This is moth mullein, uh, a beautiful prairie plant uh, that Terry took a picture of on one dewy morning here a few weeks ago. 
Um, there's no bugs that I can find in this one. It's probably still too cool. Uh, but uh, next week we have a pretty picture I've got queued up. Uh, that's a beautiful Pete with some uh, uh, living things that fly but aren't aren't uh, birds. So anyway, that's the PowerPoint for this week. Um, All right. You know, and if people have pictures that they want to send in, you know, send them to Explore Alliance at explorescientific.com. And Scott will post that. Explore Alliance yep. at explorescientific.com. Send us your pictures, and we'd love to include your pictures from around the country. And there's – Dan, are you growing a, a tail? It looked like there was a tail growing out of your arm. I got a, I got a cat. <laughs> you know, one of, the, one of those bird predators on my lap. I think you have <laughs> – kind of I just can't put him down. He'll jump right back on my lap again. I think you have a cat by the tail. Uh, so oh, anyway, uh, uh, let me do I stop <laughs> We also uh, have a bird predator here. That's not yes. exactly good news. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, that's why you keep them in the house and go on down the road. Okay. So real quick, before we switch over to Caitlin. Hi, Caitlin. Good to see you. Hi, um, Caitlin. I am going to share my screen. We said we were going to announce the winner. Last week was uh, Fort First Light Chronicles 40th episode. And we gave away a 52-degree 40-millimeter uh, eyepiece. Wonder why we picked forty. Hmm. Yeah, strange. Hmm. Uh, and so uh, we're going to go ahead and announce the winner here, and he's already been uh, notified. Uh, so the winner of the First Light Chronicle is, and the winner was uh, fifty-two degree, forty millimeter waterproof eyepiece from Explore Scientific, and the winner is drum roll, please. I should have uh, figured out how to put in a drum roll in here. Uh, Martin Eastburn is the winner. Martin Eastburn. All right. And we've notified Martin already, and it'll probably be shipping out to, today or tomorrow to head off to Martin. Yeah, um, I think Martin's a birder too. So he's going to send in some photos, I think. Good deal. So yeah. next week, and, and here, and the question was, you know, everybody that entered had a chance that there was no right or wrong answer. What is your favorite constellation and why? And we got some really cool explanations of why. Um, and we're going to share all those uh, next Wednesday. Uh, but, uh, you know, he provided 15 reasons why. And I'm not going to bother read them other than to say there's a lot of historical things that he found really cool. Um, uh, you know, it's the eighth sign of the zodiac. Um, and it's his zodiac, zodiac sign in the end of October and for my buddy Pluto. So here's his 15 reasons why he loves the glorious constellation Scorpio. And he was the only one that that entered Scorpio. There was a distinct pattern otherwise that probably people can guess mm. uh, that um, it, be, it became uh, uh, two camps. So uh, uh, Martin was the outlier. And then there's two other camps, and we'll get into those next Wednesday. So you got to join there and figure out what those two camps were. So with that, Martin okay. Eastburn wins uh, an eyepiece, and I've stopped sharing my screen. So now it's uh, – I'm done. You're and, done. Uh, okay. Yep. All right. Okay, so we're, we're going to transition to the next show. We've got uh, just a short uh, intermission. Dan, thanks for coming on again. And, uh, you know, I'm already starting to learn more and more about birds, so it's really cool. Um, we'll be back. Hey, Dan, I'm going to go ahead and email you the birds for the next two episodes. Yeah, do you have any uh, woodpeckers uh, selected yet? Yes, we have. Uh, let me see. Because I know we have a lot of a lot the, a lot of them from Sheldon. Yeah, we've got one uh, not next week, but the week after. Um, I've only got. I don't have enough birds, and I just looking at. Um, I will send you what I have, and I will dig up a. Uh, I've already got one in episode four. I will dig up something else for episode three from him. And, okay. And uh, 
go from there. So exit full screen. All right, gentlemen. So I'll let you go, Scotty. All hey, right. Thanks, Take care, Dan. Dan. Thank yeah, you, thanks, Scott. Kid. See ya. Bye. 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 Bye, -bye. How does planetary habitability evolve over time? Our mysterious sister planet Venus may have once had oceans of water, yet the Venus of today presents a different face with an incomparably hot and inhospitable environment. Lurking in its massive atmosphere are the clues to how a planet went from an oceanic state to the inhospitable state of today. And within that atmosphere, particularly beneath the clouds, is a chemical laboratory awaiting discovery. Connections to oceans, perhaps to volcanoes that erupted more recently, or even to the history of the last billion years of a planet that started life like Earth. And those volcanoes and those rockscapes are hidden from our views and yet are waiting for us to return as we put Venus into its context. Understanding Venus's extraordinary chemistry is the first step to deciphering how the evolution of habitability may play out on billions of planets beyond our solar system. Venus, here we come. Well, hello everybody. This is uh, Scott Roberts back at you. Um, and uh, this is our 157th uh, Open GoTo community program. So that's very cool. Yeah, yeah. Our, um, our special guest today is Caitlin Aarons. Caitlin was on yesterday with a guy named uh, Tim Hamilton, uh, a professor uh, of, uh, of physics and a director of a planetarium, and he gave an incredible um, uh, presentation on gravitational lensing to probe the early universe. I mean, they're, they're using techniques that just kind of blow my mind, you know, that they can do this. So um, something I did want to ask him was uh, he talked about using some sort of lensing technique, actually using the, uh, the, the atmosphere of Mars and uh, you know, and that that made me think. Well, could they use um, when they get to colonize the moon? Can they use Earth's atmosphere to lens? Um, you know, other things. I don't know, but uh, it was uh, it was a question I had. Caitlin, how are you today? Oh, I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I um, I was pleased. Uh, you know, you had mentioned on yesterday's show that you'd like to. Um, you'd like to talk about Venus and the upcoming missions. Um, so I know that that was somewhat recently announced. Um, uh, what can you tell us? Well, I can guarantee you that we're still all a buzz about it. Uh, it. You would think that we would get so used to just missions like this, like, okay, right. yeah, oh, yeah. Have another, oh, okay. Mission. another mission. Oh, goody. Uh, but no, it's, it's so exciting because there's a lot of competition involved. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of heartache involved. You have these massive teams that are uh, they don't just like write a piece piece of paper and, and just go like here choose me. It it takes years to build up these teams, build up the proposals, and then to either get selected or not, and then you would have to try all over again uh, from square one. So it's a completely interesting experience uh, to actually get a mission to be approved. Mm. Uh, so for us to actually have Venus missions uh, now, it's like, okay, so what? But as far as Venus goes, uh, the US hasn't been to Venus for quite some time. Uh, we haven't had an orbiter to Venus since 1989. Wow. That was with Magellan. And then we haven't had any sort of descent probe uh, since 1978, and that was the pioneer. 
Uh, so there's so much Venus science that we still don't have a bloody clue about. Magellan gave us some fabulous images, but it's not enough. It's absolutely not enough. And uh, so it, there's only one mission working around Venus right now. That's with the Japanese space agency. It's called Akatsuki. Uh, but we <laughs> we need to go back to Venus. Uh, NASA needs to go back to Venus. So uh, originally they were just supposed to choose one mission. So it was a total surprise that they picked both Venus missions. Oh, wow. Uh, it was, no, uh, it wh was why are we going back to, to Venus after not being there for so long? I mean, we, we, sent, we sent down a probe. We learned some things about Venus. Um, uh, you know, I, th I think a lot of money right now, uh, uh, you know, and interest, of course, is being spent on Mars. And, uh, I, I, and I know that there's other interplanetary spacecraft going on out there. But, you know, we're looking for life. Uh, and I had heard that there was uh, the potential of finding life maybe in Venus's atmosphere. Is that now uh, an idea that's dashed or is no, that it's part still, of it? It's still kind of an idea, um, but now not so much of bacterial life that I, or microbial life that we would have uh, potentially on Mars. But now it's a matter of could there be building blocks um, how to upstart astrobiological life in the cloud layers of Venus. There's cloud layers on Venus that are totally breathable and uh, very temperate, maybe only like 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Very, very uh, nice. Uh, but the rest of the planet is just pure death. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so understanding why that cloud layer, why is it the way it is, what is what in the world is going on with Venus's atmosphere? I then that's a huge push toward both of these new missions for Venus for sure is to figure out what in the world is this atmosphere? How in the world did it even form? And so it's a cross between looking backward as to how it formed, what was the evolution of, of Venus's atmosphere? Uh, it's just right at the border of the habitable zone in our solar system. How did it form the way it formed? And then looking toward the future, understanding Venus's atmosphere can give us a better idea of how does our own atmosphere work? Hmm. Because they're, they're both terrestrial planets. Right. I, they may have slightly different surfaces to be sure, but did something I, in the evolution of Venus's atmosphere I happen geologically? Did it happen astrophysically? Like how, how did it form? And then looking at our own atmosphere, our own climate, uh, especially our own climate crisis right now, it's, it's going to be an interesting comparison. So that's, a, that's a, one of the major drives. There's a, a list. <laughs> Caitlin, so I, I got a question about that. Couldn't it be the difference in the internal makeup of the planet compared to earth in, in terms of uh of the materials and other things that that may have contributed you know the number of elements and that the amounts of different elements in the crust and the of venus compared to earth that caused the atmosphere to do that maybe Possibly. In, independent independent of anything else i guess so it's, it's still under, a matter it's a of geographic or geologic formations would be an important part of this study right Oh, for sure, for sure. It's just, it's very difficult to study the surface when it's yes. 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Right, uh, so right. that's why we have an orbiter and we have a descent probe. Uh, so as far as geologically, yes, but it there's still reasons as to like, it can't be just pure volcanism. Usually volcanism, you would have a lot of sulfur involved. You would have uh, certainly a lot of vapors involved and that's fine but we're not seeing all sulfur. There is definitely sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere of Venus to be sure, but it's, it can't be all just from the volcanism. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there's gotta be something else with the, uh, the greenhouse effects going on in there. Uh, and it's just a mess, absolute mess. Now, as far as interior goes, we actually do not have a clue. Right. whatsoever as to right. what is going on in the interior of Venus. We just assume 
that it's the same as Earth because they're terrestrial planets. But that we certainly know that's not the well, case. That's much not the case with because, Mars. well, the thing <laughs> is also something slammed into the Earth, which made our core much bigger than with the moon also. So that's going to be a big difference between Venus and Earth also, I think. Well, that so and maybe Venus is spinning on its head, too. Well, so. the solar insulation that you get there, that close to the sun, plus uh, does it even have a magnetic field that's near the strength of... So, you know, so there's a lot of things that can go into it, not just so, not just the greenhouse effect. For sure, for sure. But the, the overall thing, everything that you're asking is, is exactly why we need to go back to Venus. Otherwise, we're just having pretty pictures and still don't have... A clue what's going on we have pretty pictures from magellan we got the a little bit of what the atmosphere is made of from uh from pioneer and and the venera uh landers from the soviet union there's only so much we can do with those but now with our technology and that we're you know not only uh making certain technologies smaller but also more heat resistant is also really good too uh, and also corrosive resistant is also good too. Uh, yeah. Then all of that technology can certainly push us forward into answering all those wonderful questions because yeah, we would love to have answers as to like, why is there a runaway greenhouse gas effect? How did it form? Uh, what's gonna be the future of Venus? Did it used to have an ocean? That is also a, a completely interesting question as well because uh, there may be, some uh, remnants of water, uh, not liquid water, but some of the rocks may have had interactions with water at some point. So if it had an ocean, where did it go? Did it even have an ocean? Did it have tectonic plates? That's also a debate as well. Hmm. Um, or is it what's called a stagnant lid, which means just the whole crust is just one giant plate. Yeah. Uh, so there's just a number of questions, but we really do not have a good idea. I'm curious, uh, Caitlin, uh, as, as we start to ramp up for these next um, two missions here, what has been the collaboration like with, uh, with uh, Russian planetary scientists on, uh, or is there collaboration? Is there anything that we can learn as far as, um, you know, what it's gonna take to build a spacecraft that's gonna survive the hostile environment? For sure. So we do have some uh, some minor collaboration with uh, with the Russian Roscosmos uh, is now what it's called. Now Roscosmos is actually in the planning stages of having a new Venera lander. So that's mm -hmm. going to be exciting then too. Mm -hmm. um, but they're they're still in the very very early stages of of planning that. Um, the unfortunate part with the Venera though was. Um, at the time we didn't understand data archiving. So a lot of that Venera uh, lander data is lost. Oh. And it's, it's absolutely heartbreaking to be sure. Uh, so we still have like very, very sketchy Mariner uh, and Pioneer um, data. Magellan is kind of our, our best data that we have. Mm. If, you, know, you look in the right place and you squint your eyes and tilt your head, it looks fine. Uh, but, but there's still some pretty pictures, at least from the Venera landers, you can Google it and it has like the really pretty panoramic shots, um, either just looking down at rocks or kind of a nice little landscape there. But all the atmospheric data that we would have had, um, any other data, <laughs> chemistry data that the landers would have had sure. is, is just gone. So. Wow. Uh, it's sad. Yeah, it, and uh, so when will the when will the teams be picked um, for these for these missions, or have they already been picked? Yeah, so the teams have already been picked. They'll grow when the mission starts to get a little bit closer to their launch time. They're hoping to launch at least by twenty twenty nine at the earliest. I may end up being both of them may end up being twenty thirty. Um, but the, the two missions, though, you have Veritas out of JPL and you have Da Vinci Plus out of Goddard. And then recently, the European Space Agency just announced their new Venus mission called Envision. Uh, so okay. now we got 
three Venus missions at the running, all for 2030. So, awesome. Kaylin, Kaylin, I know your 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 training is not an orbital tool mechanics, but can you touch on how difficult it is to, if I recall correctly, slow down to get to Venus? Yeah, absolutely. Venus is uh, <clears throat> Venus is usually our our wind up to either spitball us out to the outer solar system or at least to Mars, uh, maybe even to Mercury with uh, like how Bepi Colombo um, did it. It's on its way to Mercury. Uh, so we technically use Venus as that slingshot. And now that it, that being our target, yeah, slowing down is, is interesting to say the least. But if anything, we've learned from the European Space Agency I had the Venus Express run for a number of years, uh, and a lot of the European Space Agency are our collaborators. So the engineering side and, and transfer side of uh, the orbit is certainly in the hands of the Europeans right now. Um, Akatsuki, out of the Japanese Space Agency, they've been going strong since 2010. Uh, so by all means, we're, we're all kind of like relearning everything though, but. Once we once we get figured out like how big to make these things, that's kind of where it's at right now, is building up what instruments do we want on the descent probe and on the orbiter, and just kind of go from there. Because you have you only have X amount of money and X amount of space and mass to be careful of. So that you know this is why we're giving them till twenty thirty for a launch, so that way they can build that up. <laughs> as cheaply as possible as cheaply as possible <laughs> that's right so caitlin are you on one of the are you on the goddard team no but i do know quite a few people who are on the goddard team okay. and they are still like hide the clouds right now every time i ask them like how you doing and the thing about venus missions is that they've always been in the running uh for a number of years at least seven hmm. years uh where they would always get so close yeah. And mission, you know, second best doesn't give you a mission. Right. It's always the first spot. And so I think Venus being rejected for so many years now, I and then finally getting two Venus missions, both sides that would have been competitors mm -hmm. are now collaborators. Oh, and cool. uh, and so the, it's just this huge rush of, of uh, the Venus community going like, I can't yeah. believe we got picked. <laughs> uh, you talk to any Venus person and they're still trying to process the news. And it's been like two weeks ish since the announcement. Yeah. And they're still, they're still very much uh, on, in the clouds of Venus. Uh, but what I, I will be doing later in the future though, is to collaborate uh, with some, with some Venusians on some of the volcanology on Venus. So that'll be something interesting for me because I'm still, you know, a Pluto and ice, not, <laughs> not Venus and hot. That's right. That's right. Well, excellent. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for coming on and giving us some uh, insight into uh, the, these upcoming missions. And uh, we look forward to uh, your next uh, install of seven months of science. Um, I think you might have talked about the the next uh, program. Do you uh, do you? I couldn't recall uh, who would be coming on. Yes. Yeah, so the next speaker uh, is going to be Dr. Abel Mendez. He's out oh, of right. Puerto Rico. Uh, That's right. He's one of the lead directors of the astrobiologist, Earth. right? Yep. He is an astrobiologist. He's going to chat about the legacy of the Arecibo telescope and a little bit about what he does with the Astrobiological Institute in Puerto Rico. Excellent. Okay. That's great. That's going to be a great talk. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, Caitlin, right. thank you very much. I know that uh, uh, you were, you're, you're very busy over there at Goddard and, and we thank you for taking the time with us. Uh, thank you so much for letting me I, I chat about Venus. We love it. <laughs> so, we love it. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye, All everybody. Right, take care. Bye. Bye-bye. All right, Jerry. So um, uh, you are you were going to talk about troubleshooting today. Yeah. So 
I, early last year, maybe it's been a while. I, I, we kind of went through this talk. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about it again in terms of uh, not just basic troubleshooting the PMC eight system and the mount and think and thinking about all the different components and what you, it's good to understand how things work. That's a, that's the first thing. The rule of troubleshooting is you have to understand how things work, right? Before you can see if it's wrong, if it's acting up. Although most people understand the high level operation of the system, you know, they say, well, it didn't point to the right place. It didn't, you know, it's not, it's not uh, tracking right. Why is it, why is it not, uh, why is the deck motor not working? You know, the RA seems to work, you know, mm -hmm. why is the, uh, you know, why can't I get it to um, guide correctly? All those kinds of questions. That's, those are operational type questions. Uh, but underneath those, there's, there's actually um, the components that are related to those questions that you really need to decide and understand the, how the thing is built to really say, okay, if it's a, if it's a, tracking issue what's involved with the tracking what components are involved and then you can start understanding or digging into where or point pinpointing where the problem might be so that's kind of what i want to go over in a, in a fairly you know this isn't going to be a three-hour talk by any means <laughs> it's like a 20-minute talk although it could be easily it could be i could get into it for days if you wanted me to you know but that's how not about we do a marathon for. yeah no so that's fine. not uh, no <laughs> <laughs> i mean it, yeah, no. <laughs> I yeah, think we'd no. have maybe two people in the world that might be interested. <laughs> yeah. And and two of them, well, maybe four. Me and Wes are two of them, maybe. And then Yeah, you're the two. <laughs> yeah. So let me uh share my uh let me share my screen here. And so this is a quick overview of, of troubleshooting. And 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 the other thing I wanted to bring up is um the recent changes that we've made to the system and how it might impact some of these questions that uh, we might have and what uh, other people have. So uh, this is meant to be an introduction to figuring out what the heck is wrong with your mount. <laughs> All right. So uh, I don't know if I got this. Let me zoom out a little bit. I want to be able to skip. I guess I've just got to scroll that. So <clears throat> there's certain concepts involved with troubleshooting and I know all the technical people out there will understand these. Um, this is really meant for people that are new to electronic systems. Maybe they're familiar with operating things but not so much how they're built or how they're designed. Um, and so that, this is kind of an introduction to that. So you, one of the things you have to identify the components of the system. You have to understand what configuration uh, is involved with the system in terms of settings. There's certain settings that, that systems have certain, uh, and then the system state, which means what mode is it operating in at the time when it fails. So the system state is important as a concept to understand and then you get system performance, okay? So these four things right here are basically describe the system as a dynamic, as a dynamic thing. And uh, understanding each of these pieces helps you to understand how to troubleshoot the problem. And then you get into what failures can occur. What are the failure modes for the components and for the system overall? And how does it behave? What behaviors does it demonstrate when it's failing? What behaviors does it demonstrate when it's working correctly? All those types of things. And then you've got the impact of the failure. So that's part of this behavior. So you've got the failure, which is the event that causes that, that uh, that's the failure itself. And then you have the behavior or the effects of the, of the failure. How does it impact? And it could be a disparate uh, different different things uh, that it would impact. Maybe it impacts your guiding, but it also impacts your your go to performance. You know, they may seem unrelated, but they're related at a certain level. So that's always that's why you need to understand the system in terms of the components. And then there's something called the failure modes and effects analysis, which is basically a formal way of looking at this the failure behaviors. 
it, it itemizes all the different mode failures that can occur in the design space. So you, you've designed this thing, but you know that you might have a uh, failure in the motor drive system. Let's say the belt can slip off. Maybe there's a deficiency in the pulley or the way you've mechanically mounted it or designed it, or it could be an electronic or a mechanical failure. That's something else that I can bring up here. So all those things are related. One of the things, this is kind of an esoteric type of thing, the interaction between a mechanic, the mechanical portion and the electronic portion. Sometimes we build electronics to compensate for the mechanical deficiencies of the system. And uh, so that interaction is also important to understand. All right, enough of that. Now, Book Davies has a title for your new book, Jerry. Oh, a new book? Yeah, your, your PMC-8 mount and you. Yeah, right. <laughs> and troubleshooting for the amateur engineer and astronomer. Well, I, I could probably write a big book for, uh, on the PMC-8 system, how to, you know. And, I, and that's something I was, I was thinking about. The, uh, the, owner, the user guide that I created for the PMC-8 is already close to 100 pages. So you could add another 100 pages pretty easily to talk about the whole system and how it works and everything. Sure. Uh, so you talk about the system components. This is fairly high level. You've got the mount, which is the physical. And uh, physically, the mount has a right ascension worm and wheel. It's got the worm pulley. It's got the motor pulley. And it's got the motor and belt. The same thing with the declination. You've got a declination uh, axis worm and wheel. It's a two axis system. So basically we replicate the components on each of those axes. So that's the fundamental idea in troubleshooting is which, which axis is screwing up or which axis has got the problem. Is it either one or both? If it's both, then you know it's not, then it's something that's common to the mount. Uh, such as the controller and you got the motor correct connections. Now they're, they're separate connections, of course, one for the deck and one for the uh, right ascension. You got motor cables, you got the guide port connection. Uh, so you can break down the mechanical failures in the electronics down to really mechanical connections. Mm -hmm. Typically, typically the electronics themselves got a much longer mean time between failure or long, uh, much higher reliability than the actual connections. The connections are the weak point in any, uh, and it's not just motor connections, but it's all the connections that are available. And, and we've got uh, one, two, three, four, so five. So we've got five mechanical connections on the uh, PMC-8 on the large box. We've got the uh, Wi-Fi antenna connection to the circuit board. We've got the right ascension and, and declination uh, cable connection. We've got the ST4 port connection. Okay, those are the five that we have. And then we also have a, um, a push button, which is a reset button, which is typically not used a lot. So, but it could still fail, I mean, you, you may be trying to use it and it's not doing its thing for some reason. That's a mechanical thing that's on the circuit board. But other than that, that's the only mechanical connections we have with the electronics. Oh, and then the battery, of course, the battery connection, which is really the most important one in some regards because, uh, and it's maybe the easiest to troubleshoot because uh, you either got power or you don't typically. And, and you could have a failure where you don't have enough voltage that's the only other power related item that you might have. Uh, the other thing that are components are actually computer uh, programs. You've got the Explore Stars application and you've got the ASCOM driver that runs on your host computer. And then you've got the ASCOM client, which is another uh, piece of software that's running. Sometimes getting those connections working correctly are really tougher than getting the physical connections working and the physical mm -hmm. mount system up yep. and running. Pekka has a question about ASCOM. He says, can I use all my ASCOM related gear that I have today if I change to the last Mandy G11 with PMC8? I would see no reason why there should be any problem. Right. So any application. So at the client level, 
any application that uh, that can talk to your telescope can be connected at the same time to the telescope to get data off of it and to send commands to it. The uh, you use a hub, which is what we use Poth for. Poth is mm -hmm. a is an ASCOM uh, client that serves up the mount to any application that wants to talk to it, basically. So, so things like his Celestron uh, focus motor, his Star Sense, his ZWO, um, um, you know, EAF yeah. system. Yeah. That it, it shouldn't matter what the what the hardware is if it's. ASCOM, it's going to talk. That's correct? right. It's yeah. ASCOM is a is a um, is a common object model for any astronomy related component or or uh, piece of equipment that you might have, and they've got drivers for every every manufacturer that builds astronomy equipment. Pretty much gives you an ASCOM driver. Now some some you still have programs that can use the native. They're called native drivers because the drivers talk directly to that piece of equipment. There's no translator, there's no API that's common. And, but the, prob the problem with that is that if the manufacturer only provides their low level language, that means every client that gets created to talk to that component has to talk that language. And it's a pain in the butt for programmers to, to code 50 different, let's like say it was 20 different cameras out there, right? Mm -hmm. In the old days, when Maxim DL first came out, it had to write drivers or it had to write, um, I'm saying code to talk to each driver for each camera, which means it had to have a subroutine or several subroutines for each camera that are, that are uh, unique to that camera. That's a lot of time and effort for the client to write. So now the client says, well, how many cameras do I really want to support? You know, maybe I'll only support the top five cameras out of these 20 cameras that are available. And that's not good for the manufacturers at all. So that's kind of what you run into if you don't have something like ASCOM to talk to the equipment. All right. So now, any other questions from that? I've got this fancy uh, diagram here that I made up. You can see like our user, he's really worried about seeing something bad. <laughs> yeah. So he's got, oh my gosh, <sighs> my system screwed up. And these are, I, kind of, I tried to make it high level and give you some idea of how you can break down this, the way this system works. So you have these performance errors that are possible. Uh, Configuration inputs could be an error. User, you know, if you have user knowledge gaps, if you don't know everything about the system, you know that could cause performance errors. Lack of experience, system familiarity, you know, all this stuff is is related to the user uh, in some regard. All right. Application application software can have uh, have certain things that you have to think about that go on with the system. You know, there's a graphical interface. There's input configuration for the application. You know, you could have hand paddle control. You have a celestial database. You have navigation features in the software. You have a pointing model perhaps in the software. You have all these different things mm -hmm. that are built into the application level. And any one of these could be bad or could go wrong. All right, so some of the things that could go wrong uh, are alignment calculations could be off, object coordinates could be you know bad or different or not what you expect. You could have communications drop out, that type of thing at the application level. Uh, at the driver level, you have all this stuff that goes on at the driver level. Um, let me zoom up a little bit more. Um, you know, you got the API, you got all the different commands that you and methods and, and properties that you can use. You have engineering unit conversion, time calculations, system timing things that go on. You do pointing and tracking functions, slewing and guiding functions, and then of course system configuration. And then you can have these types of errors also. So all this stuff has to be checked out. When we when I release a driver. 
I have to test to make sure I haven't broken anything when I've, when I've made changes to the driver and I could easily break some of this stuff, you know, depending on what I'm, what I'm updating. So that's the kind of thing that could be, uh, that could pro cause problems for the user. Um, at the firmware level for the PMC eight, we're a low level motion control system. We don't have, so the stuff that typically is in the firmware is up here at the driver level for most systems, but in our system, we've separated it out. We've made our firmware as simple as we can get it to make it and as precise in terms of its performance as, as we could make it. So that makes it easier for us to troubleshoot it and to, and to do, um, do changes and all. So you've got things like, you know, the input, input uh, command interpretation, output, the output uh, to the motors, what it's supposed to do, logic decisions that would go on in the firmware, that type of thing. Um, and the scope, so to simplify the, um, basically to simplify the troubleshooting of, this, of the firmware, we've made it as, as uh, simple as we can. That's, that's the key to all this. To make troubleshooting easy, it has to be simple, every level at every level. Um, and then you get down to the hardware level. What kind of failures can you have? Uh, you know, you could have temperature current problems that drive the, the electronic hardware, to cause it to fail. Connectivity problems with the hardware. Physical connections, which is a big thing. So any, any physical uh, mechanical equipment that you have, you always want to look at the interfaces between the components, where they, where they come together. How they're how they're held together uh, to maintain their their uh, reliability. That's that's really what you want to look at for any kind of physical component on the system. That includes the mounts, the way the the motors are mounted to the to the gears, the way the 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 worm and the wheel are mounted. All that stuff physically has to be correct to make it work right. You know, any kind of looseness, any kind of things falling off you know any kinds of things uh mechanically not where they're supposed to be that can always cause a problem and so um that's what we're talking about down here um it's also design you know typically we weed out design errors during the testing when the manufacturer first builds the prototypes but you still have manufacturing quality so you have two levels of problems. You have design problems or you have broke fix problems. And I, and manufacturing quality is, is kind of a broke fix problem. Um, it's not a design issue. Typically design issues uh, rear their head when you haven't tested all the cases that you're gonna put that product under use. So you've got this weird use case that's really maybe on the edge or maybe less than a quarter of a percent of your users would run into maybe the temperature is too low that causes a mechanical problem you know uh, maybe it's too high and the batteries don't last or the bat or something like that you know so we're talking about design error design problems show up on edge cases where you have extreme use cases okay not normal use cases what it's designed for and in, in the nuclear field, it's called a design basis, uh, beyond design basis accident is what that's called. <laughs> okay. Beyond so if design. we have a beyond design basis problem on the mount, then we can't guarantee it that it will perform at that level. Although Scott's done a good job with the XS2 of pushing the XS2 to beyond design basis, <laughs> by loading it up. And our customers uh, pushing the uh, limits on the IXS100 yeah. as well. Right. So we do have some uh, margin and that's what margin's about also. So yeah. when you talk about design beyond design basis, you're talking about eating into your margin. Okay. So understanding all these pieces in terms of the error, uh, the, the design of the system and the components that make it up uh, and how they can fail, that's, that's are important things to do. Let me zoom back out here. Let's see what our next slide is. Okay. So now I've got this nice slide that talks about 
uh, it's, I call it a configuration cheat sheet. It talks about all the different things that you think about when you go to configure it. Um, you've got the Explore Stars configuration for wireless, which is you've got to take pay attention to your wireless F, SSID. It uses the UDP IP protocol. There's default network settings. There's two and three star alignment stuff that you uh, that you configure. And we use the uh, PMC8 command language. And so I've got some notes about it here. Uh, you got the ASCOM client configuration for wireless. It uses TCPI network. Um, it's got the default settings that it uses. It requires, and it requires a, a physical polar alignment when you use an ASCOM. And it uses the ASCOM telescope API to communicate. Uh, same thing with the wired, you got the DB9 connection to the USB adapter, um, COM port selection. So these are things you consider when you're looking at the configuration of the, of the PMC-8. Um, this kind of lists what are in, uh, what Wi-Fi modules are used in each of the systems here. And then there's a note about it here. So this is just a general uh, sheet. You can download, I think I've got this up up on the uh, forum, you can download this sheet. I'm trying to I'm trying to move this thing around, and it won't always move around. It's trying to uh, try to highlight it. So that's that's a cheat sheet that I put together to know what's involved and what you're looking at when you go to configure the system. You've got the uh, I've got to update this to include the new UFCT with the uni universal firmware. I've got to make another one of these up. All right, so some of the failure modes that you could have. How long are we going? Am I am I going long yet? I've mm -hmm. probably got another ten minutes. I can talk. Oh, Maybe sure. Or five or five minutes. Yeah. I won't cut you off, Jerry. Okay. So uh, <laughs> I don't know if the audience. Sorry, is, five minutes are up, dude. <laughs> yeah, is the audience dwindling? That's when you know to cut me off. Yeah. <laughs> No, so they're, the they're all riveted. Oh yeah, I'm sure. The uh, component failures, you can have you know, the mount failures, the axis and a worm and wheel binding. You have that issue that comes up. That's fairly common if they, they need a, the uh, worm and wheel need to be adjusted. Mm -hmm. you know, your counterweight balance, you know, you know, you need to balance your scope when you put it on there. That's right. Every time you take it up, you put it up and take it down. So many people don't do that. I, and I, I don't I don't get it. I mean, they they um, are expecting real high performance out of their telescopes, yet uh, a lot of times they won't balance their scope correctly. You yeah. Know? So there's uh -huh. a whole series of things you have to do to set yourself up for success. Basically, that's what it comes down to. You mm -hmm. want to do what you can that you what you understand to make it work the best that it can be. That way, you won't be disappointed in the in the system. Um, so you could have, you could have a controller failure with a serial Wi-Fi selection is wrong. That's one type of thing. If you selected serial and you're expecting the explore stars to connect up and it doesn't, uh, now the new universal cert, the new universal firmware has solved this problem mm -hmm. because now you can connect to either serial <clears throat> or Wi-Fi, um, without having to do anything. It's always available to connect to. That's nice. So we've gotten rid of, so the, the goal of the design, right? And to the fixes that, and improvements that we make uh, to the system is to get rid of failure modes mm -hmm. for the user so that he doesn't have to worry about stuff and to make it easier and better in the operation of the system. Um, so that's, that's kind of how we identify things to fix in future designs. That's a design decision uh, on how we solve problems. There's also um, ways to solve the problem where you do training, right? Getting the, getting the user knowledgeable about the system can always solve some issues that they run into. Um, and that's kind of independent of this. This is kind of what I'm going through here with this training, but there's certain training you can do to understand the uh, system that if you operate it this way, then it always works. If you try to make it do that, it might work in some, in some regards, but it's not the best. 
And so you know to stay away from those areas. Uh, and that's when you know to push us to make a change to the system to make it do X, Y, and Z if you want it to do that, um, as long as it's within the scope of the system. Uh, you could have location settings that are problems on Explore Stars. You know, the latitude and longitude are very important to get an accurate go to and an accurate uh, to get an accurate go to. Uh, same thing with dry, some driver settings and the ASCOM driver. Um, so these are some of the things that you might see. This mount just stops moving. It makes noise while moving or it makes noise while stopped. You know, those are failures. Now, in order to detect these things, any of these things, you have to understand what is correct and what when it's working. So you have to be knowledgeable of what's your normal expectations when the thing is 100% working. And then when it when something changes and you can detect it, then you know there might be a failure. And the failure might be in your settings. It might be in in a broke fix thing. Maybe the maybe the maybe it's an environmental impact that's changed. Maybe you've been using it in the summertime and and then you put it away for the fall. And then you you said I'm gonna go I'm gonna go use my mount. And it's 20 degrees outside and you stick it out there and it worked great in the summertime, but then now the temperature is so low and it cools down and now it doesn't work very well because the butt gears bind or something. So that's the kind of thing you might have um, mm. in environmental change. Uh, you might have moisture impacted, although we do, we've done some design and manufacturing things to mitigate some moisture problems like uh, the system has uh, got conformance coating uh, uh, conformal coating on it so that it, it uh, is moisture resistant. And there's, and the way the heat, um, the way the uh, thermal design is on the board, it helps keep the enclosure warm and keep the board warm. So even if it gets really cold outside, the electronics don't freeze basically. Now you do have to take care of your battery in cold weather. That's always a big issue. And when it's really cold, you really got to keep your battery True. warm. And then you, you don't want to you don't want to leave it sitting outside for an hour or two before you turn it on. You want to immediately hook it up and, and start drawing current off the battery. That helps keep the battery warm. And of course your other the other equi the electronic the equipment. Yeah. yeah. So you know the exposed the application can have problems where it moves the mount in the wrong direction or, or points to the floor and you say what the heck is going on here or it does not point accurately so there's a lot involved with this problem you know it could be one of five different things that where it doesn't point accurately and you have to be able to understand which is, which it is you know which piece is it um and you have to know which to what what to check so you can isolate it to the specific thing that's actually causing the problem. Uh, and then, you know, the ASCOM driver doesn't slew correctly. That's kind of like the same if it doesn't point accurately, it doesn't slew correctly. Those types, types of things could be related. So that's, that's an overview of uh, what's involved with learning how to troubleshoot your PMC-8. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mm, no. Uh, Book went to know if we were sending our PMC-8 to the Aberdeen uh, Proving Grounds for uh, <laughs> field testing. Yeah, right. <laughs> but I, I don't know. Uh, although I will say that the PMC-8 is a very rugged um, electronic system. We did use mil-spec electronics, and they are conformal coded. Um, when I was developing the PMC-8 with Jerry, one, one of the things that was on my list is that it would be completely, utterly waterproof, you know, and um, while we probably have done that as far as the board goes itself, all the connectors, in order to get waterproof connectors on, uh, that was going to raise the price, like, hugely. Oh, wow. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it would have been... Yeah very expensive so yeah those uh, water those gaskets and all that on the connectors and building the enclosure so that when we put the yeah. connectors on it to make the seat for the for the you know o-ring right. or the uh, rubber gasket you know 
So anyhow, uh, but I would say that for outdoor use, it's absolutely designed to be an outdoor electronic and, um, um, you know, so, and probably can handle, you know, rain and that type of thing, but uh, yeah. not being submerged under three feet of water. So, right. That's, that's kind of the limit. It's, it's moisture resistant and it's right. very moisture resistant. We've had our PMC eight in the uh, Mark Slade remote observatory. It's been installed there for, over three, four years, almost probably, hmm. almost well, probably almost a little over four years, and and powered up continuously also. So we, oh, so it stays on for it stays it on, on all the time. So it's been yeah exactly. So it's I test the heck out of it that way. Yeah, and it's used quite often. So right, well, that's what that's what we want. You know, mm -hmm. I I don't want you know certainly don't want to see units being returned because of electronic failure. So. No, we've probably put 20 years of at least 20 years of normal use from most consumers on the thing over the last five years, probably more than that. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Okay. Well, Jeff Wise says this episode needs to be bookmarked. Okay. So <laughs> I'll, uh, we'll do that. Um, uh, I am starting to build up uh, an index of, um, of shows. Uh, although Jerry would like to index all the information in all of our shows, which would be quite a chore. <laughs> so, cause we, we are, they are fairly information packed and yeah, it'd be um, cool if, uh, if YouTube, if you could get a transcript off the show with YouTube or some other, uh, service that would be I know, possible. Maybe. I know they, I know they, well, you know, they review the, the audio. And if you bring up certain things, they probably block it. So, you know, they're doing a transcription of the audio somewhere, uh, it seems to me. And if it, we could make that available, then it'd be easy to search each transcript for each on each show and look for certain words and or index well, it, you know. We'll have to test that on, on one of our shows. Yeah. No, okay. YouTube, YouTube does it. It's on the YouTube slots that's there. You can turn on closed caption and create a transcript that way. Oh, can you? Yeah, there's there's a way to do it. Well, maybe that's what we should do is just create the transcripts for each episode and then go through and index them based on the transcript. Sounds like a great job for you, Jerry. No, I've got I've got a job already. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be nice if one of our intrepid listeners would would uh, <laughs> would do it <laughs> in the open go to community. Yeah, maybe would, uh, maybe someone could take like one show or something like that and do it. So. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, uh, we'll have to see how it goes and how easy or difficult that might be. Um, but until uh, until that time, uh, you know, we will start to uh, put together a separate page for the open go to community where uh, we have all the shows listed. So that's a little bit of a, uh, a job. Jeff Wise says the Astro Imaging Channel has a very cool way to index their episodes, and I'll send you a link. Good, great. I, I like that. Um, well, uh, I guess that's uh, that's the end. Um, I'm excited about uh, the Venus don't mission. So, don't be so depressed, Scott. This is the end. This is the <laughs> end, my friend. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's right. And so much like uh, Jim Morrison, do I? Okay. Anyhow, um, thanks for uh, uh, bringing on uh, that segment, Jerry. Uh, Kent, I think that uh, On the Wing is uh, developing to be a, a pretty interesting show. I, I downloaded this, um, this new app um, that allows me to uh, record birds but that, either if I just photograph it or if I um, have it record its uh, bird song and it will tell me what the bird is. Is that so, picture bird? What's that? Is that picture bird on the iPhone? Um, Not picture bird. What's it called? Uh, picture bird. <laughs> I just had it. Um, yeah, picture bird. <laughs> no. No, it's not. It's called Smart Bird ID. Okay, Smart picture, bird. Pi picture Bird is the one that Dan recommended last week. Yeah, and I have that one too, I think. Yeah, that one's oh. pretty expensive. I was, I gritted my teeth and 
<clears throat> spent more money than I've ever spent on an app in my life. Oh yeah. So well, no, that I had be that much money. It was 40 what, bucks. 30? Yeah. Oh really? Right. So with this bucks. one right here, this, uh, this bird ID app, you can join their community and that costs like that costs $30, you know? Uh, but uh, apparently all the other features are free. So, uh, so that it all works. And what else do I want to mention? Um, Tomorrow we'll have uh, uh, microcosmos voyages. I'll be back with my microscope, uh, exploring the unseen world. And so, um, and then uh, next, we won't have shows again until next Monday and, until we have uh, Dr. Daniel Barth coming back with How Do You Know? Until that time, guys, uh, the weekend's coming up. I hope you have uh, clear skies uh, wherever you are. And, um, uh, let us know if there's anything we can do to help you. Take care. Thank you.